Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 885. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 8th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. We are very glad you could be here. Uh, we understand that certain parts of the U.S. have been underwater and inundated with uh, hurricanes and flooding and stuff like that. And so if you have internet and power, you're able to watch the program, and we are very pleased with that. You are in our prayers. Um, this has been a devastating time, clearly, for uh, portions of North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, um, Virginia, Florida, uh, you name it, uh, the Southeast is going through just a, a horrible uh, late summer here with hurricanes. And uh, know that you are in our prayers and that uh, uh, we are hoping that resources can become available to you so that you can recover from this and that uh, in the end, uh, God would be glorified in this. George, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good. and I, I'm a weather nut. I love these times. It's exciting to me. Uh, we had to cut the show short last week because I had a, a emergency come now message, mm -hmm. and I went to a lady's home and she was in the dying process, and I was able to be with her and her family. And because she was not under doctor's care, we had to wait for uh, the police to give an all clear to release the body to the undertaker. So it was a six hour, seven hour thing. But you know, it's sad when anybody dies, but it is just so wonderful to be able to be part of a family's experience and to offer them comfort and joy and the knowledge of of their mother's uh, will. They will see her again in the resurrection of the saints. It's just yeah. I got to tell I keep saying this, but there is no better life than that of a parish priest. It's just wonderful. You only work one day a week, play golf six, and get paid too much. It's great. What, is that? Yeah, is that how, I don't think people understand how hard it is to get you uh, on camera for an hour. You have a very busy I, I schedule. I know my <laughs> golf and uh, my <laughs> cocktail party rounds and yeah, everything. Yeah. People so, think that you uh, oh, putting the show on. Oh, it's easy. It's a breezy. I said no, because he's a full time parish priest and he doesn't know how to say no. And you know, I get I get one little block between like nine and ten or ten and eleven on a Tuesday, and w w I just I'm ready to press record. I'm all read up on the articles so that I can ask a wonderful direct questions and get get it going. And that's not as yeah, easy as people think. Yeah, I, I want to talk to you about something. I was reading that George Stephanopoulos makes $25 million a year for doing an hour show on Sunday each week. What? I think we're underpaid because we do an hour each week, and yeah. uh, I'm not getting $25 million. I, yeah. if Is there something you can do about it? Should I, I I'll work it out. I, I would wage say labor negotiations or something. A, a higher percentage of our audience loves us more than George's audience loves him. And so I maybe just by that, but uh, we're, we're earning our treasure in heaven. And I, I hope to get a, at least a, a three room condo when I get up there. So yeah, it's short, on the shore. George, so uh, let's talk about the storm. Um, we just uh, had a week and a half ago, Hurricane Helene. It did everything a hurricane uh, is ever promised to do. Uh, it was a worst case scenario. It hit Florida. It uh, washed all the uh, sand that was in the ocean onto the shore. It brought in a 12 uh, foot surge. And I don't know if people know this who don't live in a hurricane zone. Most people who die of a hurricane die from what, George? They die from flooding. They yeah, die from dry, drowning. Drowning, yeah. They don't yeah. die when they get hit by a tree from the wind. They get yeah. they dr they stay where they are, or they're in their car and they drown to death. Yeah, because they've not heeded the warnings to get to higher ground. And in, as the storm continued into the Carolinas, uh, it dropped rain on top of uh, the 12 inches of rain the Carolinas had experienced the week before. The water had nowhere to go except build up. And once again, most of the people who died. Uh, from Helene in the Carolinas died of drowning. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it brought up the rivers to a torrent. Um, there was nowhere to go and the rivers rose and uh, the, the water raced for the ocean and it took houses, people, cars, uh, and animals and livestock with it. And it's horrible to watch. We live in the part of the country where uh, many of our snowbirds, seasonal people, their summer homes are in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Yeah. 
And so we, uh, I've been in touch with some of them and some of them have come down early and um, just uh, horrific reports. So, you know, I was in the grocery store at the delicatessen counter and I was dressed like this. And this woman came up to me and said, she said, are you a priest? I said, yes. And she said, well, I'm Jewish and I'm not particularly religious. I said, well, Jesus was Jewish and I am religious. So uh, what could I <laughs> we'll do for, it for you? It, yes. She told me, you know, she had, she was, her daughter had brought her down here from Asheville, where she's from. Uh, her house has been destroyed. To her two neighbors on either side of her, their houses slid down the mountainside. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to know why God would allow these terrible things to happen and why did God allow the Holocaust to happen. And so in yeah. the Delicatessen Counter in Publix, which is our local supermarket chain, I chatted with her and prayed with her and encouraged her. And But this woman is seriously, seriously traumatized. Um, the devastation you know if you're 70s and 80s and you lose everything you know all your life memories and your house is wrecked it's it's hard at any age but the older you get the harder it is because you realize you can't replace and restart it start over again. right the uh uh reports around here coming in that uh to our south the churches in southwest florida along the beaches uh Madeira Beach, Treasure Island, Clearwater Beach, all those, all the places you all go for the white powdery sands. Well, that sand washed ashore and was pushed by the storm surge to several feet across these barrier islands. And these places are pretty much badly damaged. Our neighbor, we're eight miles, eight, eight miles ten, inland, yeah, yeah. eight to 10 inland and about 100 80 to 100 feet up in the air. Uh, we just had a few shingles gone. But our neighbor, St. Anne's and Crystal River, had about, uh, uh, well, they were flooded, and they have about 18 inches of, the eight, up to 18 inches of flooding in, in the church itself. Fortunately, their sanctuary, their altar area is lifted up, and their linens room was uh, is, is wasn't wrecked, but all their classrooms, all their offices, everything had 18 inches of water and they were able to pump it out, but it's a small congregation in terms of people, maybe 50, 60 active members. And the uh, assessor came by and he said, well, you have at least a million dollars damage and you got to take up about two feet of drywall and all the floors and you got a million dollars here. And now we've got another storm coming in that if it does the same thing, there are going to be Episcopal churches and many churches that are going to have to say, you know, we may get an insurance payout, but is that going to be able enable us to even begin to replace what was destroyed, or do we just shut the doors? Yeah, I mean, do we want to rebuild a church from the 1940s or 50s that housed, you know, two or 300 people when our congregation is barely that of 30 or 40 people? And mm -hmm. yeah, that's something you're gonna have to, to look at. Uh, you get the insurance check, but do you want to rebuild where you are with what you had? Mm -hmm. And um, now that's the same problem. We talked about 60, 70, 80 year olds. You know, how do we start over? Well, the churches mm -hmm. have to think that way too. Do we start over with the mindset that we had uh, 50 years ago? I don't know. You know, yeah. you, your church is shrinking. We got a story about that. Uh, like story five, five or six, we'll talk about in about half hour here. But you know, my our, my denomination is shrink. I'm sorry, not your church. i did I offend you? I'm so sorry. The Episcopal Church is shrinking and merging and uh, uh, not growing. George's church is doing fine. Thank you very much. Despite like my waistline, we're expanding. Yes. Uh, sometimes <laughs> well, exponentially. But <laughs> yes. So the newest hurricane, Milton, is coming ashore. It's currently a Category 5. Now, if you watch the Weather Channel or Fox Weather or any of those um, weather things, the meteorologists are absolutely going berserk. Because the, here's what they'll say. Never have we ever seen anything like this. Now, I need to back people up a little bit. We've only had satellite technology uh, to watch uh, hurricanes develop for about 50 years. We've only had good satellite technology for 12 years. 
So the fact that they have not seen this before in such massive enormity and expansive category 12, you know, whatever they want to call it, is because, well, we haven't been watching the oceans for that long. This is kind of a new technology. George, I'm going to think back to watching a local St. Paul station uh, when we lived in northern Wisconsin, and the weatherman would come up there, and he would have little foam cutouts to show where the uh, low-pressure system was and the high-pressure system was, and he'd paste uh, another one he'd paste up there for where the rain is coming. We've come a long way in our ability to uh, report and predict the weather, and uh, uh, I don't know if you can remember those days. Oh, yes, and... Also, I've been in Florida since the mid-70s, and mm -hmm. as a teenager, I remember Hurricane Andrew. Uh, we lived in Miami at the time, uh, and uh, no, we had moved out of whatever it was. I remember <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> you do remember. It hit Miami. We were yes. living up in the Palm Beach, yeah. and my, you know, Miami was devastated, and that's the last time we've had a hurricane of this intensity as Milton. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, though, it's coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, uh, overnight, the, uh, the center has shifted south so that it's going to come ashore near Bradenton rather than Tampa. Uh, that's good news for us because we're in the north side, so that means we'll just get wind, not water, to the people to the south. Uh, and they had a hurricane two years ago, the one that yeah. just devastated Santa, Fort Santa Myers Santa and Island, yeah. Santa Naples. Island, yeah. They are going to be the south of that, but the water is going to be pushed up again. And the reason why the, the water is such a big issue is that the Gulf of Mexico is fairly shallow. You can go about 40, 50 miles and still have only 200 feet, mm -hmm. uh, 50 to 200 feet of uh, sea level, of uh, ocean depth. So the water doesn't have great depth and it gets pushed forward by the winds. And the way the hurricane winds will work and the way the tides are expected is that it looks like the same people who got hammered by water last week and uh, two years ago were going to get hammered again. And us, and we uh, inland would just get the wind damage. George, we become our parents. We become weather experts, po political experts, HGTV experts uh yeah i mean you don't show up here for weather but george and i are both from florida and uh clearly here in the united states weather has been topic number two it's not, now today it's number one uh for a long time politics will be the number one topic going on in the country i don't have any political stories that we need to talk about this week we'll give you guys a break let's well, move, uh, uh, there, there's okay. a third topic uh while i was in the grocery store uh See, I live in what we call Christendom, where it, if I go out like this, people will stop me. Sure. And and I always get stopped, and it's hard to get in and out of uh, public places dressed like this. And uh, besides uh, concerns about the hurricane, I was asked to pray, pray devoutly that the Mets lose. What's wrong with that? Well, I, I, that's, I, that's, I, that I, is more important in some people's mind than a hurricane. It, are the Mets... <laughs> going to you know that the phillies beat the mets and you know that god's justice be done in this life now truth be told jill and i have our favorite football teams okay and she you can is... manage to keep 25 <laughs> 30 years of marriage together because of it too yeah, in spite I, of that it makes the passion more passionate but the fights more fightable but uh, I happen to be a Minnesota Vikings fan. I was introduced to the Minnesota Vikings in the 70s when they kept going to the Super Bowl. Uh, and they would lose, of course, in the Super Bowl because that's what you do, apparently. And uh, Jill was raised uh, on the, the Green Bay Packers, the great uh, football team from Wisconsin. And we don't introduce new churches that we go to to our NFL belief. Uh, however, you know you that we love you as a church if we show up on a Sunday wearing our NFL uh, uh, jerseys for the teams that we support, and we may offer during the prayers of the peace or whatever a, a, a reflection for the time for the NFL team we choose. But yeah, 
Well, it's Kevin. Yeah. It's why I wear a green stole uh, this yes. time of year for the ordinary. Eagles. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> ordinary times. All right, George. Let's do some. Okay, somebody is going to put in the comments. Fifteen minutes, and you're getting to your first story. No, Milton was the first story. Our second story is the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Synod on Synodality. That's a big word. Had a major doctrinal news. Now, um, we have been reporting on the migration of the great Roman Catholic faith to Episcopatism. I mean, that's my new world, my new word. And uh, um, it, it, every week that we report on it, they come a hundred miles closer to what it would be like to live at Second uh, Avenue 815. Um, it is just crazy to watch how quickly they are becoming a pseudo-Episcopal, pseudo-Anglican in their thought. They now introduce the word experience to doctrine theology, George. Hmm. The Pope Francis appointed nine study groups for the Synod on Synodality, which is currently meeting in Rome. And the Synod on Synodality is looking at new ways of doing church. One of the study groups and its members were appointed by Francis. So basically he's picking people who sort of follow his mind. Mm -hmm. ha they were charged with looking at new ways of thinking about sexual morality and life issues, contraception, abortion, homosexuality, divorce and remarriage. And this group gave their report, I believe on Thursday or Friday of last week, and they spoke of discerning doth doctrine, ethics and pastoral approaches by gauging people's lived experience through consultations between the people and the and and the church and the church responding to cultural change. And what they're saying is this lived experience is where the Holy Spirit speaks in a way that can override and contradict established church doctrine. So what we have here is the adoption of the Anglican moral theological paradigm. Now, adding what they call experience, but what they describe is what Anglicans call reason to the traditional Catholic formulae. So the Catechism teaches that the fundamental modes of transmission are tradition and scripture as interpreted by the church. Now they think we need to add a third leg to this. And I'll well, read you the quote. But, but, well, I'm Pope, sorry. Let's, no. well, I just want to back up here. As Anglicans, I, we, we understand a three-legged stool, like Richard Hooker said. We have scripture, mm. we have tradition, and we have reason. And that is, mm -hmm. that is our basis in uh, operandi for how we uh, understand doctrine, understand how the church works, and then understand how God works in our lives. That's all done through the, that three-legged stool. The Roman Catholics say... It is tradition and scripture mm -hmm. as interpreted by the magisterium of the church. Right. In the Anglican world... Essentially, it's as it is interpreted in the heart of the believer through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I'll read you a quote from their report. Ethically speaking, it's not a matter of applying prepackaged objective truth to the different situation, subjective situations as if they were mere particular cases of an immutable and universal law. The criteria of discernment arise from listening to the living self-gift of revelation in Jesus in the today of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can, some people call this moral relativism. In other words, what is sin? In Episcopal Church, we belong to saying it's a sin in Nigeria, it's a blessing in Manhattan. That's the lived, discerned experience that people in Manhattan and people in Lagos say is from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we need to listen to both of those. So the Anglican problem has been that by allowing the Holy Spirit at times to be the final arbiter in some cases, we allow people to go off the deep end. There's no real backstop. You know, the authority of bishops, the authority of churches is not akin to that in the Catholic world. These Catholic theologians who are self-picked, who are picked by Francis are saying that we Catholics should allow the experience of the believer 
to be part of the conversation. Now, here's the problem. You know, it worked well for 400 years for Anglicans. Then we allowed that experience or reason to overwhelm scripture. In the Catholic world, are we going to see tradition overwhelmed by experience? We already see this happening in the German church and the Austrian church and other places. So, the now this is not, you're not, if you're a Catholic, you're not going to see this in your church on Sunday. But what you are seeing is that within the central offices of the Vatican, the machinery, Pope Francis just pointed 21 new cardinals. Not all of them can elect a new pope, but many of them can, and the younger fellows are all Francis acolytes. Yes, absolutely. They are, they are, the, the whatever knowledge, whatever trait saying you want to be, the deck is being stacked, or uh, the cards are being marked, whatever you want to say, well, an outcoming is being prepared that the Anglican way of looking at the world is now going to be forced down the throat of the Catholic faithful. Which is but, a good thing, but a bad thing. Yeah, a good and bad, but I mean, that puts them 20 years behind uh, the Anglican Communion. The Anglican Communion had this point at Lambeth 2008 where they invited the people to who were homosexual or, or part of the queer community to come and share their experience in an Adaba format with the archbishops from, from around the world, from the primates from around the world. And so we've now come to that point with the Roman Catholic Church where the voices of the queer community or you know pick your your topic du jour have the ability to come in and, and not just have their voice but their voice has authority which mm -hmm. is something new to the roman catholic church and they are given being given a de facto validity mm -hmm. in other words they are being treated as if their opinions or their views or the spirit working in them are not contrary but are acceptable within a range of conversation. Um, the, what does this mean for the Catholic world? Well, this means that the chaos that some people s speak of today on doctrinal issues that they're experiencing under Francis, if the Synod on Synodality's recommendations are implemented, you ain't seen nothing yet because the divisions within the Catholic world are as wide and as deep and as bitter as within the Anglican world. The Germans are, the German bishops and the Austrian bishops are all, uh, Dutch bishops are almost indistinguishable from Episcopal bishops in their thinking. And, you know, from, you know, you have gay blessings in Austria and Germany. You have people pushing for women clergy at the Synod. You've got all these things and you've got traditionalists saying, not over, you know, over my dead body. Do you hear but a now, weed guy here? Hold on a second. I, mean, I, I have to selectively mute my, my microphone when, when you hear that guy talk. Uh, you, I'm sorry. It seems to be lawn day here at the campground. My apologies. <laughs> well, the, the long and the short of it is that uh, I'm not a Catholic, and I have no... Uh, business meddling in the Catholic world, but as somebody who has been down this road, I feel like somebody who's gone through a bitter divorce and who talks to a fellow who's gone through a difficult patch in his marriage, I feel like saying, watch out. Watch out. Uh, well, we it, have it's going to get worse if you don't uh, take steps now. Once you open this little uh, uh, dike in the river, uh, you can't put it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I think Second Timothy says uh, all Scripture uh, is breathed by God, and it's uh, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training of righteousness. You can't say that about experience. All experience is not breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, uh, reproof, and and whatnot. All tradition is not breathed out by God, and so yeah, I I do tend to put Scripture a little higher than I do. Uh, tradition and uh, not well, and, and reason and, and experience. And that is the Anglican way. It's not an equal equal three legs. It's no. tra scripture informed by tradition and reason, but it's still scripture. Yeah. So that's why if somebody says to me, you know, the Holy Spirit tells me to leave my wife and marry my secretary, I say, no, I'm sorry. A spirit may be speaking to you, but it's not the Holy Spirit. 
It's the spirit of lust. It's the spirit of midlife crisis. Go buy a motorcycle. Don't leave your wife. Yeah. But why can I say that? Because scripture is quite clear on this. You don't leave your wife to marry another. Despite what NFL football team she supports. No, agreed. Well, so that's your that's our uh, story for the Roman Catholic uh, Church this week. I don't know what's going to happen next week, but uh, um, it's interesting because they were always stalwart. They were always, when I was growing up, I certainly disagreed with some of their doctrine, but I knew that they would always keep that doctrine. I can't, that's gone now. I don't know what they'll have for doctrine in a decade if they're going to, you know, to to go mishy mashy on this. So we'll see. George, um, we I think we reported a little bit on this last week, but you were running out the door. Um, we had done a couple stories about what's been happening in the news with Israel and with uh, um, Bangladesh. You contacted Lambeth Palace for their reaction to stories they had wrong or actions they did incorrectly on Twitter. And what's the response? Did we have a follow-up? Uh, well, Lambeth Palace joined in a condemnation of uh, Israel over alleged land grabbing, mm -hmm. where the Israeli government grabbed some land that uh, four bishops uh, in the Church of England said rightfully belonged to a Palestinian family. Well, the facts of the matter were that the Palestinian family were lying to the bishops, to everybody they'd wanted to use. They were involved in a legal fight over property. Mm -hmm. and. That legal fight was resolved by looking at the deeds and the sale documents. And this family wanted to use the tension in the Middle East as a as a weapon to beat the their Israeli uh, the other side, the Israeli law case. And Melanie Phillips documented this in great detail. And I said to Lambeth Palace, so now that you've jumped on the bandwagon to beat up the Jews over this and it's been shown that you were demonstrably wrong what do you got to say and they said we'll get back to you and then they did get back to me and they said we're not going to comment on this we can't sure, be sure a reporter for the telegraph knows what she's talking about okay <sighs> and it's the same with uh, Bangladesh We've, we're reporting that the primate of Bangladesh reported about anti-Hindu primarily because they're more Hindus, but anti-Hindu and anti-Christian violence in the recent revolution in Bangladesh, where Muslim mobs are murdering Hindus and Christians, burning their homes, burning their businesses. There's going through a pogrom in Bangladesh, akin to what we saw in the partition of India in its ferocity. And we had asked Lambeth Palace, do you have any comment on the primate of Bangladesh's words or about the uh, evil being done to Hindus and Christians in Bangladesh. And they finally came back to us and said, they don't trust the news from that part of the world because the BBC has not confirmed it. Because the BBC has not confirmed it, it's not true. Hmm. Oh, there you go. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, you poor people. Yeah, you poor that's people right. Because you just don't know any darn better, do you? Well, the BBC is their state-run uh, for all effective purposes, media. That's our PBS. I I'm going to mute. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Mike Pilavachi. Uh, the report is finally out, and it's a good thing we have a report. It's kind of silly that we're reporting on a person who uh, happened to be a bully. Mike Pilavachi was touchy feely and a spiritual bully and uh, an abuser. He wasn't a rapist or anything like that, but he was just creepy. And the report looked into it, and Pilavachi led a phenomenally successful youth-focused ministry called Soul Survivor based out of Watford, England. And he was let go when these allegations of misconduct, sexually tinged misconduct and whatnot came out. And the reports basically, and, they, and Soul Survivor commissioned a report and they found that the attitude of the people in charge was, that's just Mike. He's touchy guy. There's no harm in him, you know. He's the guy who fills the church every weekend. If we do anything to him, we're killing the goose that lays the golden egg. And so the Soul Survivor report was very honest in saying that we had long had warnings of inappropriate behavior, but we chose not to act on them because it would be harmful for the whole. 
Now, to my mind, this is symptomatic of the whole abuse and authority problem in the Church of England, that abuse is allowed to go on by people of prominence because it'll upset the apple cart if they do anything about it, whether they're Jonathan Fletcher's or John Smythe's or uh, Bishop Peter Ball. You can't, uh, you know, it's got to be so bad so bad that it gets outside the church's control before something happens. I will salute Soul Survivor for acting quickly, because, you know, it's six plus years that the victims have been waiting for a Smythe report to be finished. Um, well, it, it's ju not just that. From We have 885 episodes of Anglican Unscripted, many of them dedicated to the lack of accountability within the church for clergy, for lay people, um, because there is a standard. We have scripture as a standard, tradition as a standard, reason as a standard, and we don't hold our clergy up to that. And mm -hmm. Mike wasn't held up to that. And when that happens, we have victims. And when a church and clergy are creating victims, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not how it's done. And uh, um, that's my biggest complaint. Oh, well, um, uh, Justin Welby gave an interview to the House magazine, which is the in-house publication of the House of Lords. And he did something that um, Tim, Walsh, uh, Tim Waltz did. Um, he misspoke. Tim Waltz famously said, I'm friends with school shooters. Now, what he meant to say was, I'm friends with school shooting victims, school shooter victims. But the goofball left out the word victims, so he sounds like he's friends with these crazy kids and their uh, weapons. Justin Welby made a similarly goof, essentially saying that he was a failure as Archbishop. He might, history will regard him as a failure. Uh, uh, now, I think what he was trying to say, might history regard me as a failure? In other words, asking it in one sense, but the way the words came out on tape was that he was a failure. Justin, I think that Freudian slip is accurate. I, I think you, you've nailed it on the head. Uh, godly leadership is not one of your skill sets. However, there's still time. There's still time to lead yourself and your church into repentance and mm -hmm. a time to, uh, to re-establish who you were into uh, the society we call uh, England. What, what, what is it with these guys? The, the, hi, it, it, it's mowing day here. So let's go on to our next story, and uh, this is this is pretty terrible. Um, if but still expected, uh, Bishop Jack Eicher of the Diocese of Fort Worth has has passed on. George, we learned uh, the other day uh, through correspondence on Facebook and email that uh, uh, Jack Eicher, who had suffered cancer, I think this is the second bout, had finally uh, succumbed to, to it. And he was a lion. He was uh, uh, somebody you will not see again in leadership in the Episcopal Church. For his theological opinions, yes, in our lifetimes we'll not see anyone elected like him. But for me, and there's so many good obituaries about him and things by people who knew him very well. I've known him for 20 plus years as Kevin, you've known him probably just as equally long as you've been active. Um, we interviewed him way back in uh, St. Vincent's Cathedral at that Ang ACN conference, just as they were getting together while Fort Worth is still in the Episcopal Church. Um, but the point I want to make is that leadership does matter. Um, Jack Eicher, was the right leader at the right time for the Diocese of Fort Worth. So many dioceses in the Episcopal Church that were once faithful because they had nice bishops, but not strong bishops. Bishops who put a premium on going along to get along rather than putting a premium on the faith once received have seen those dioceses just, look what, you know, look at, uh, look at the, look at Wisconsin. Two of the three dioceses there were very faithful. Bill, you know, Bill Wantland was a wonderful bishop, orthodox, but his successors were weak. And now that diocese is gone. I'm going to relate to you a story that I have from Bishop Jack Eicher. Um, 
an experience I had with him early on, and this is going to be back at the St. Vincent's uh, meeting where you and I uh, had an interview as well. Um, Jack Eicher did something extraordinary. Uh, right before the service where they're going to have all the, the bishops and the clergy who were there do the, uh, the walk-in for the service, um, word had come that Bishop Bruno had cancer. Bishop Bruno was from the Diocese of Los Angeles at the time. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, the moment that uh, Bishop Jack Eicher heard this, he gathered all the bishops and clergy that were uh, do, about to do the processional and said, we need to pray for Bishop Bruno. And they made a circle back in the, 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 the vestibule of the hall back there. And the prayer went on longer than I think anybody expected. But uh, church started late that day. But it started late that day because Bishop Eicher desired to pray for a bishop who at the time was, uh, for all intents and purposes, an enemy of Jack uh, Eicher. F fierce enemy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and they prayed... You know, for his healing, for for everything, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm on the right team. <laughs> it's like, holy cow! You know, it's it, it's not just to be on on side; it's to have believers on side. It's to have people who who practice their faith and and aren't embarrassed by praying for their enemy, aren't embarrassed by by gathering together. And okay, we'll delay the service a little bit. We need to pray for a fellow bishop, and, and you know, just oh. My, to, to, you know, it's, it's 20 years later, my heart just goes, oh, wow, that was just an extraordinary time. And that's that's who Jack, Jack Eicher was, you know, so. Godly leadership, godly men, uh, it fulfilling the charism of episcopacy. And there are so few people in the Anglican world today who you can say that about without crossing your fingers. Sure, yeah. All right, let's do our final story. Um, I am from Wisconsin. And when I was in Wisconsin for most of my life, there were three dioceses, Fond du Lac, Milwaukee, and La Crosse. Eau Claire, sorry. Eau Claire. And, uh, Eau Claire. If they're next to each other. That was close. That was really close, George. And so um, now there's one. And there's one for uh, one main reason there was no accountability in the church. If you want to look at the iceberg, um, there's, there's a million different reasons for why they've had to merge into one. Um, but... This is the new modus operandi for the Episcopal Church. We must consolidate, George. Yeah, October 4th and 5th was the first convention of the United Diocese of Wisconsin. And the uh, Bishop Matt Gunter, who was the Bishop of uh, Eau Claire, Eau Claire or Fond du Lac? Um, well, at the time, Fond du Lac, Milwaukee, I think. Well, well Fondelec, whatever, Fondelec, whatever, 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 sorry. He's now bishop. He was installed by the presiding bishop elect, uh, Sean Rowe, as the bishop of this new diocese. Mm -hmm. And Bishop Rowe, once again, is encouraging me by his public statements. Because what he said was that the new normal is decline and consolidation in the Episcopal Church. What we saw with Michael Curry and with Catherine Jeffrey Shores and Frank Griswold was that if we uh, Steve Charleston famously said that if we uh, have gay blessings and gay bishops, the people will flock into the church because they're just dying to be part of this. Mm -hmm. That if we go all progressive, that if we just get rid of these nasty conservatives, the people will flood in. Well, what was the result? <laughs> Merger of dioceses. So Sean Rowe is basically saying, look, you know, he, quote from his sermon, our duty as branches connected to the vine is to love and allow ourselves to be pruned by the one who's the master, to let ourselves be pruned in new ways. The Episcopal Church, he's saying, has to be pruned. Now, this is an admission that the <clears throat> policies and way of doing things of the past has been a failure. Now, how he does this is one thing. He's going to be laying off a lot of staff, the National Church Office. They're going to be consolidating dioceses. We have too many bishops for the number of di for the number of bishops. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, and in other places, we have too few bishops. You know, we've got a hundred thousand plus people in Texas, in the diocese of Texas, and we've got seven hundred and fifty in Northern yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Um, so that there has to there has to be some sort of rationalization 
Uh, but Roe is basically... Now, Roe was, when he was a seminarian, a Virginia Theological Seminarian, he was fairly traditional and fairly orthodox. But he has been a bishop of the tiny diocese of northwestern Pennsylvania, which is eerie and its environs. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he may have been as they say about Republican politicians when they get to Washington, he has grown in office, meaning he's taken on liberal liberal values. But he's not stupid. And I think he does see that, uh, well, his public statements to this point acknowledge that we've got a major problem and we've got to change course. I have read sermons of his and some of his public uh, writings in the last three or four years and they're not all encouraging. I mean, he clearly he has been on team. Now he mm -hmm. may be trying on his team, and so maybe he's going to change the way. Maybe he has learned that his way, th those ways were not the ways to grow a church. Um, I and in my mind, I'm like, yeah, but was not the Episcopal Church the branch that was pruned? Is it not lying on the ground right now, withering to die? Um, and so, you know, I, I wh how far do you want to take that allegory? However, uh, we pray for the church. We pray that uh, we could all return to the fold and, and uh, become one again, uh, to be a better representation of Christ. Um, uh, that's my prayer, at least. All right, well, so... Yep. It, it, if I take that a Go little ahead. further, mm -hmm. I'll say yes and no to your statement about is the Episcopal Church a, a branch that has been pruned. I, I would say yes, that's partially true. But I would also say all denominations have been pruned in recent years mm -hmm. and what's taking it place is something new that we've not seen before in my church here in this part of the world um a generation ago this was just all six weeks ago this was all cow pasture and the people here um very few lifelong episcopalians people come here who are catholic Pentecostals, we've had a bunch of Jehovah's Witness, a lot of a lot of former atheists, non-believers. I'm working with a person who is a tarot card reader and a Wiccan who has accepted Christ. She wants to know how much of her old job she has to give up. All of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that we worship in the Episcopal way, but that's secondary to our identification as followers of Jesus Christ, as Christians. So the old denomination, so the denomination of the Episcopal Church has no future. The Christian faith has a glorious future. And I like to worship in the Episcopal way. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you have all the tools available to be a wonderful, vibrant church. You don't have the leadership available to be a, a, a vibrant church. And Jeff, Jeff, what? Did you see Jeff Walton's article about Wheaton College up in Illinois? Yeah, he forwarded yeah. it to me. I'm a horrible friend. I haven't read it yet. Sorry. Yeah. His, his, his article was that uh, there are these non-denominational Protestants or people uh, going to Wheaton College who are discovering Anglicanism and going into the Anglican ministry from a Baptist background, from an independent background, from this background and that background, because what the prayer book offers and the tradition and the historical reason, all that makes sense to them as a valid expression, the most worthy expression of Christian life and worship. Those guys are almost all going to the ACNA, of course, um, but the Anglican way is far from dead. I think it's thriving. It's thriving here in Hooterville, Florida. Hooterville, for those who don't know, is an old TV town that was a Hick, the atypical Hick country place uh, that, uh, you know, hillbillies lived in. No, I, yeah, well, it's good to refer to that. And I'm going to give you an example of that. The church that we uh, attend, Trinity Anglican Church in Tampa, uh, is led by uh, Father Travis Lowell, who was non-denominational until a couple of years ago. He returned to the liturgical uh, form because his parents were raised Episcopal and he had loved that tradition. And he decided that he was called to return to the liturgy and he wanted to start a church. He didn't. 
go non-denominational, he found a way to go uh, with the ACNA uh, and be a church plant in Tampa. Over the summer, and you know as well as I do, summers in Florida when the church attendance goes ballistically low, um, the, the bottom drops out, you hope those uh, uh, snowbirds come back. He grew his church to two services. He's not, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so he was a church plant two and a half years ago. He's now up to two services. He's putting out apology letters. I'm sorry you showed up on Sunday and there's no room for you to sit. We're trying to work that out. We're going to, you know, and so, but he, he re fell in love with the liturgy and he's leading uh, a whole bunch of non denominationals who come to his church in the liturgy. And it's kind of cool because I, I've been <laughs> part of the Episcopal Church since the 90s. To have it re-explain, he, he'll explain what he's doing every week, uh, because you guys aren't an Anglican. You probably don't know. You want to know what's happening, and he'll explain the liturgy as he's doing it. And for me, and, I need a refresher once in a while. So, and this is not just an American phenomenon. No, in a Cornwall, in the little town of Fowey, Fowey, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Fowey, F-O-W-E-Y, mm-hmm. uh, there was an independent Anglican church planted five years ago, and it is doing very, very well because people respond to the natural godly rhythms of Anglican worship and when it's coupled with sound doctrine and strong leadership in the pulpit and and in the pews man it can just go places so it's not just an American southern phenomena this is no, something that's happening yeah. around the world yeah like liturgy Anglicanism's greatest um, gift is it offers form and function and um, you know, I, I sadly, right now we, we, it's being run by the Keystone Cops in many areas around the world, and uh, they, they keep stumbling over themselves, forgetting who they are and who they were. And I'm sorry to see that. All right, George, um, boy, politics are coming up on us here. It's October 8th as we record this. That gives us 24 days until the election. Now, 28 days till election. Ouch. It's coming up, George. Hey, I'm not nervous about the election because I have hurricanes don't run. Uh, what's happening down there? People, uh, their minds are on hurricanes. They're not thinking about politics. Topic number two is replaced topic number one. Absolutely. The, well, because of where we are, politics really isn't that an issue because it's already decided. Yeah, deal. it's, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll see more signs for the contested sheriff's election than for Trump Harris uh, because I don't, there may be some Harris voters in the county. I haven't seen them. Um, I'm joking, of course. But no, it's uh, this is it's it's like it's the opposite. California, California always has these massive Democratic victories because mo- most Republicans know there's no point in getting. Don't up. bother. Yeah. Don't bother because mm. the Democrats are going to win. Florida is almost this is almost the reverse. There's no points for the Democrats to spend money and with there's no very few TV commercials, if any, on local TV. The only political commercials we get are from the national networks like Fox or CNN. Um, there's no point in spending money in Florida because the outcome's already determined. Yeah. You buy just the population and and also the success of Governor DeSantis and uh, the state's prosperity compared to the rest of the country. Well, one of the things that this hurricane is replacing is tourism. People are not coming down, and the the fall into winter here is when tourists hit Florida, and they spend their money and they go to the hotels, they go to uh, the amusement parks. Um, that's probably not going to happen in the same degree it did before, uh, just because of cleanup after Hurricane Helene and uh, now Milton. And uh, there's a lot of people who go to uh, my church and go to your your church who are part of the tourist industry, mm-hmm. and uh, that's going to be very hard for them. We want to keep them in our prayers. Um, we have we have a few. We have one fellow, for instance, who runs charter boats for fishing and mm-hmm. manatee watching. Uh, his uh, boat parked in Crystal River was like three blocks inland, and you know boats. I'm not a boat guy. I don't know how much it costs to fix the hull of one of these big things, mm-hmm. but it's it's a lot Massive. for fiberglass. Yeah, it is. 30, 40, 50,000 bucks. So, all right. Uh, cool. That should do it for the show. Um, please keep uh, our nation in our prayer. Keep, uh, If you are able to, 
um, in any way, shape, or form, uh, donate to the Red Cross, the Anglican Relief and Development, the Episcopal Relief and Development. Um, uh, I got an email from uh, e, somebody in the Episcopal Church explaining about the 60 or so churches that were affected by uh, the North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Tennessee uh, um, hurricane. Uh, equally, active churches are uh, affected by it. Uh, if you have the means financially to support them, please do. Um, I got an email from Jenny Noyes, or I saw a Facebook post that uh, they're not taking uh, pre-registration for new wineskins next year because uh, there's some damage to the facility we use uh, outside of Asheville. Um, she will update us as, as that time comes on. I'm Kevin Coulson. Before we close, Kevin, there's one thing. Oh. Some people will ask this, and I have to tell them. Why am I wearing my Clark Kent glasses? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Because <laughs> Kevin sent me a light, and when I use the light, these are non-reflective, and all you see are little circles from the yeah. light right here. They glare. <laughs> and so I have to use my driving glasses, which have our anti-glare. Well, so I, I'm I not making same... a fashion statement. <laughs> I have that same light right here. Whoops. That's the, the, the circle of the light in the uh, the glare of the window. Um, it's just part of us trying to look good. It's so hard to get this old face to look less wrinkly. And look at those wrinkles on my forehead. And what happened to that mane of hair? Uh, I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 885 of Anglican Unscripted.